you guys might be familiar with most of this stuff yeah <clears throat> so what are the key points for uh, gastric cancer uh, so the multiple types of gastric when you say stomach cancer the multiple types it's not just a single organ it's multiple things uh, so we we usually refer to gastric cancer only when it is starting from the mucosal lining the, from the interior from the interior side uh, but there is a different group of diseases called the GAST uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors so that comes outside so similarly we have neuroendocrine tumors and a whole bunch of other uh, uh, adeno that uh, pancreas that uh, junction gastrogeogenal also this uh, uh, what is that called this um, uh, wherever the pancreas is joining the stomach I totally forgot papillary papillary adenocarcinoma <laughs> these things are so rare you know we don't even talk about these things right so, yes, no so gastric cancer we only focus on uh, that originates from the mucosa of the of the stomach and uh, age diet diet has a very big role to play uh, earlier we had a gut microbiome seminar uh, so we talked a lot about how the gut microbiome has a, a very huge impact on the on the health uh, so diet is very important and also pre-existing illness, uh, any other illness, uh, GA, GA tract illness, all these are risk factors for developing gastric cancer. And symptoms very common, you know, like uh, all these indigestion problems and uh, pain. Pain is the most common uh, and also discomfort, bloating and all those kind of uh, common symptoms, which is easy to ignore. See, we, we have a very unhealthy food habits, right? Uh, so we eat KFC and Burger King and uh, we have all this spicy food. So it's easy to disregard uh, a serious illness, uh, assuming it's just some food poisoning or something I ate didn't I didn't it didn't accept right. Uh, so, but if it happens once, you know it's something to to do with diet. But then, if it keeps coming again and again and again, that's why the, the history is very important. It's a recurring episodes, and these episodes are occurring at a more frequent time. Uh, that is very important. So there's this uh, the very first chapter we read in uh, in the book of medicine Harrison's is all about history taking but today in this past past universe nobody has the time to take history so the only way to identify or detect gastric cancer at an early stage proper medical history number of episodes frequency of episodes uh, and uh, as on the patients they, they should approach the doctor as soon as possible that's where the we have to create some awareness awareness creation is very important and some of the infectious causes like H. pylori is also very common, but luckily the treatment options available for H. pylori. Chronic inflammation eventually leads to, it's not just stomach, any organ, chronic inflammation, even oral cancer, they chew tobacco all the time, leads to chronic inflammation and that leads to eventually cancer. So also pernicious anemia, uh, intestinal metaplasia. So before a full-blown oncogenesis, there's always some kind of uh, uh, DNA damage, which leads to a metaplasia, and also polyps. So there also there are some familial syndromes, uh, adenomatous polyposis, also other viral infections like EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. So these are all well-documented uh, causes, very easy to diagnose and uh, very easy to uh, identify also. Uh, also certain countries like uh, Japanese, Asian countries, uh, they eat uh, high salted and smoked foods, dry fish, you know, but they don't have enough vegetables or fruits or fiber. Fiber is very important. Also, foods that not have that have not been prepared properly, or sometimes there's also the scanned foods. Uh, there are some industrial contaminants, pesticides, insecticides. Uh, that's why you see now there's a huge revolution happening. People are now going for organic and natural sources, uh, sustainable sources, instead of going for this kind of packaged and processed foods, right? Uh, also, males, male versus female, males and older males, uh, age and sex has a huge influence. And obviously, smoking, al alcohol should also be in this list. So all these are environmental factors. Uh, but what many people forget is cancer is inherently, this is a message, a common universal message I keep telling everybody. Of course, the environment has a huge role to play. And food is a big part of the environment. But there's a bigger problem which people usually tend to ignore is the genetic risk factors. Everybody is born with this uh, pre-existing genetic risk factors. It's very easy to find uh, whether you have a higher risk compared to the population, yes or no. There are so many companies in India offering this kind of uh, tests. It's better to, if you have a family history of cancer, it doesn't matter, it has to be a stomach cancer. It could be any cancer. 
any family history of cancer, particularly relatives, uh, mother, father, sister, brother, like that, uh, even mother, maternal uncle, mother side also, mostly on the mother side, right? Less on the father side. Uh, so a lot of uh, ex-linked uh, risk factors, uh, maternally, maternally in, inherited risk factors, germlines. Sometimes it's not even in, a, in the coding region, it's in the non-coding region, some polymorphisms, uh, which are prone to uh, predispose, genetically predisposed to develop cancer. And then there is an environmental insult. So there's a genetics and environment working together. So it's not just environment alone, right? Uh, so for example, in lung cancer, uh, we see female and uh, non-smokers also get uh, uh, developed lung cancer. So uh, men, men are more prone to develop lung cancer compared to women. So female and smokers are more prone to develop lung cancer, but non-smoker. So female non-smoker lung cancer, how do you explain, right? So the, the only explanation is genetics. So that is the key. So if you suspect family history, there is something we, we recommend go for a, a cancer screening test predisposition. Many companies are offering in India also and abroad, like a <clears throat> 23andMe kind of companies are offering <clears throat> this kind of test. So once the patient come, walks into the clinic, uh, what are the most common symptoms? Uh, this is a very, very common, this is just a list I taken from the uh, cancer.gov and also checked Cancer Research UK. So I'm basically combining uh, UK and US guidelines uh, because some doctors are comfortable with the UK guidelines or European guidelines. Some are comfortable with the US guidelines. So I have been mainly trained as per the US guidelines, but I thought I'll include some important points from the European side also. So indigestion, stomach discomfort, bloating, nausea, appetite, heartburn, acid reflux. So acid reflux is very common nowadays. Uh, we see people popping antacids and other kinds of uh, for the heartburn. Uh, a long-standing chronic symptoms and multiple episodes should suspect they should go get some uh, testing done, uh, some endoscopy done. Uh, it may not be a full-blown stomach cancer. Uh, acid reflux leads to the esophag esophagus gets eroded and that leads to further complications. You get it can also lead to esophageal cancer. So esophageal cancer is very, just like uh, pancreas and ovary, uh, it's very poor survival and there are not many treatment options. Uh, so the other common signs and symptoms, you know, like blood in the stool, there are many kids already, people are doing this test. Uh, also weight loss, unknown reasons, that's for all the universal, uh, some uh, lethargy and uh, tiredness, uh, weight loss, unexplained weight loss, also in TB, <laughs> when we see unexplained weight loss, you always see, is it tuberculosis or cancer? So you have to rule out tuberculosis first. And pain, pain is the number one uh, uh, symptom. Uh, and also jaundice and also ascites. So ascites, we know there's uh, something really wrong with the liver and other organs. So also trouble swallowing, then we know there's a problem in the esophageal gastroesophageal uh, junction. <clears throat> or it could be just a dry esophagus. A lot of people who have acid reflux, uh, when they even drinking water, it gets stuck in the esophagus. So it takes it takes time for the liquid to move downwards, you know, with peristaltic uh, movements. So whenever you have this kind of symptoms, which you think it's not normal, right? You think it's not normal. It's better to go and get tested. So what are the different diagnostics modalities? First, are obviously, I said history taking is very important. Uh, it's a forgotten in current day clinical practice. I'm sorry to say this. Recently, I went to, uh, went for, I have, a, I have, a, I'm myself a diabetes and hypertension. I went recently to a hospital. I was pretty disappointed. In fact, I was giving pointers to the doctor. Have you checked this? Have you checked that? <laughs> you know, I'm not a practicing physician. I'm running a startup company. Uh, but history taking is how we learned medicine. So even before I order, I pick up the prescription pad and order a diagnostic test, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, on physical examination and history taking. That is very important. Then only the blood test comes. Uh, CBC, complete blood count, we can find many things. Uh, most important for, uh, for especially for gastric cancer and esophageal, how to go for endoscopy. Uh, we have a good relationship with the AAG hospitals and Apollo hospitals. Uh, we have some really fantastic uh, people who are doing endoscopy <clears throat> and uh, ultrasound guided endoscopy is also there and now there are a lot of this flexible new technology has come uh, which is uh, very easy to uh, not much discomfort for the patient right so a lot of new new innovations have happened in the endoscopy uh, the more traditional approach is barium swallow that's multiple x-rays 
uh, or there's a real time capturing real time we can monitor the beam swallow uh, ct scan and pet ct so pet ct scan comes later uh, when we want to confirm the extent of the cancer is it only localized it's is it spreading to nearby lymph nodes or is there any evidence of distant metastasis uh, any liver involvement or pancreas involvement those kind of things we need, we need to go for pet ct scan MRI with gadolinium is very commonly uh, recommended. Uh, and also laparoscopy, if, if you don't find anything in endoscopy, there's nothing on the inside, maybe there's something on the outside. So you go for laparoscopy. Then you do a biopsy, right? So, and uh, traditionally you can do a pathology, HNE, IHC. There's a bunch of markers, minimum five to six biomarkers uh, specific for uh, gastric cancer, also K67 for the proliferation index. Uh, they also check for the mitotic index. So there has to be, Metaplasia, there has to be evidence of uh, uh, proliferation, cell proliferation. There has to be cytokeratin and a couple of other uh, important biomarkers uh, for, for the pathologies to diagnose. And they also do the grading, just like how we do staging, clinical staging, they do the grading. So it's a grade one, two, three. And in staging, we have from stage zero to stage four. And tissue biopsy also for uh, genomic testing. Uh, which is not commonly done. I was just talking to uh, AstraZeneca. We had a meeting earlier. Uh, somebody was asking me, what is the number? I said, if there are 100 cancer patients, only five patients actually get the DNA test done uh, because of lack of awareness, 95% uh, of the cancer patients don't even know there's a DNA test. The same biopsy. You already did a biopsy, already did pathology. The paraffin blocks are simply sitting in the, in the department, right? So they have to keep it for at least... Uh, uh, period of time like five to ten years uh, as per the protocols nabh protocols they don't throw away the, so it's a leftover samples these samples you can send it to a lab like us and we can extract the dna and the rna and we can do further testing on that now nowadays we are doing comprehensive genomic profiling on the tissue biopsy also we usually collect blood sample also at the same time so you can get liquid biopsy where we look for the selfie dna after sequencing, we analyze, we find the tumor origin cell PDNA. So this is for complete uh, comprehensive genomic profiling, looking at all the mutations like HGFR, uh, KRAS, BRAF, those kind of mutations. This is our main approach. Uh, unfortunately, there's lack of awareness in India. So genomic testing is only handpicked the certain cases, like for example, lung cancer. Uh, every doctor in India, the moment they see lung cancer, NSCLC, by default, they order that entire EGFR panel uh, or they go for the 150 gene, 150 gene, 300 gene panel, whatever panel they like, right? But the same importance they are not giving for uh, things like gastric cancer or renal cell carcinoma or any other cancers, even thyroid cancer. They think it's only for lung cancer because it's part of the guidelines, right? So lung, colon, breast, uh, not even ovarian. So lung, colon, breast, and prostate. These are the four cancers they order the test. If, if you ask me, Genomic testing has to be uh, brought for everybody. It should be universally for all cancer patients. Uh, that is the key. Uh, because if we can identify the molecular subtypes, so pathology can only tell you malignant yes or no, and what subtype, which is serious, mucinous, whatever subtypes are there, that's all they can show, tell you. But they cannot tell you the molecular uh, uh, subtypes. Uh, then is there a HER2 gene over expression? Then we have a treatment available, right? So like that. Is there a VEGF? Is there a tumor infiltrating lymphocytes? A lot of things we can do uh, at the uh, genomic level, uh, at the DNA and RNA level, not just the protein level. So that is what is missing piece of the puzzle in the, in the diagnostic modality. Today, most of it is imaging. Most of the diagnostics is blood test, right? routine, routine testing and imaging. That's the That has been the standard of care, but we need to bring genomics as the mainstay uh, as a, as part of the routine clinical workflow, that's the that's the that's the change that we want to see. <clears throat> so we we keep talking about metastasis. So the problem here is, it's you can talk to your doctors, you can talk to your colleagues. Uh, it's very rare to see stage one, stage two, or even stage carcinoma in situ. Very rare in India, especially. By the time patient walks in, uh, they're already at advanced stage three or stage four. So there's already there'll be some invasive. Uh, nature. That's the reason the pain is more, they have all those problems. That's why they come to the clinic, right? Uh, so metastasis is very important. Uh, if you can detect metastasis at an early stage, then the whole treatment approach will change based on that. How does the cancer cell spreads from one part to another part? Initially, it invades the, the, the different layers. So here you can see uh, starting from the mucosa, then you have the submucosa, then you have the 
the muscle layer of the serosa and then you have the outermost layers right so initially it invades uh, locally and then once it gets into the lymphatics then it starts spreading everywhere then eventually it gets into the venous and then goes into the arterial blood system then it's all over the body it's systemic so if you can catch it uh, when it is locally invasive surgery is practically curative surgery followed by chemotherapy adjuvant or neo adjuvant but once it spreads in the once it enters the blood stream that's it we cannot do much uh, then we have to try different approaches so that's why identifying whether it's metastatic yes or no at a very early stage the entire treatment plan will completely change based on the diagnosis <clears throat> and <clears throat> just like the four stages we have now sub stages uh, this is i don't want to go into details you can get it in the guidelines so basically stage 1 you have two types 1a 1b then you have two you have two types then three you have a b c and then you have stage 4 so basically this is where the us and uk uh, the guidelines are slightly different if this guy says 5 cm 5 mm that guy says 10 mm uh, but if there is 5 mm cut off right so so the pretty much a lot of overlap between the two institutions not a big deal but this is this will help us to identifying uh, what's what is the stage of invasiveness is it locally invasive or is there a lymph node involvement or there is a distant metastasis so then based on that the treatment strategy will change <clears throat>